Please remember, the information in our podcast could be a trigger for some people. If you or someone you know has been affected by childhood sexual abuse, the Dublin Rape Crisis 24-hour helpline is 1-800-777-8888. Hello, I'm Joyce. I'm June. And I'm Paula. We're the Kavanagh Sisters and we'd like to welcome you to our series of podcasts where we continue to shine a light on childhood sexual abuse and its impacts. In today's podcast, we're joined by Leona O'Callaghan, founder of Haven Hub and sexual abuse survivor, and Sophia Morphy, also a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. We'll discuss the impacts the coronavirus and its restrictions has had on each of us and how our own survival mechanisms that we used as children rose to the surface the longer the restrictions were in play. Have you any awareness of the impacts that COVID restrictions had on you in relation to your past trauma? Leona, do you want to take that one first? It's kind of affected me a lot. In what ways? I suppose just being on my own and COVID itself in the sense of the isolation. Because I struggle with with PTSD still at times, dealing with, with memories at different times. Being on my own when I was a kid would have been very much filled with face and reality of what I was hiding from. So now that I, I spend so much time on my own, it brings all that kind of stuff up. And the same with the depression that comes alongside the worst thing we can do is be in our own mind when we struggle. We need to be around other people and COVID has stopped us from being able to do that. So no matter how many tools I used, a lot of my tools were based around doing the things that keep me well that will, I suppose, distract me in some ways and then in other ways just fill me with things like joy and all that. And, and you take all them away without warning because none of us knew it was coming all my wellness tools and the different things that I would have built up throughout my life. Suddenly, I'm not able to kind of put the the action in place that I planned for when I start to struggle. I would have found I've dipped a lot and regressed a lot and just struggled a lot more than what I normally would. I think how I handle fear is I just pull everything in. I just pull every, I get depressed. I get very down, very heavy sensation an inability to literally physically move or to want to and it's a real lethargy I just feel like everything is drab it would trigger your trauma because as a child what was happening to me was too big for me to deal with I was overwhelmed I had no voice no choice there was nothing I could do and there's a trigger in this COVID situation insofar as it's too big I can't tackle it myself so it shuts me down I do have fears that there might be something going on that I'm unaware of and that's too frightening because how am I going to find that out I haven't got the ability to find out if I'm right if it's true if there's anything there so what I have to do to survive is focus on something and for me our podcast and putting up posts on Facebook and trying to help other people has been the best coping mechanism I have developed uh, to give me a purpose, a reason to get up in the morning. And what about you, Sophia? I think the one thing that really stood out to me is I felt trapped. And when I was a child, I had no one to turn to, nowhere to go. And it was kind of, you know, you can't go to see anyone, you can't go anywhere. I, I'm going to be honest, I kind of missed my dad through all this. Right. And what about your dad did you miss? Yeah. Yeah, what in particular did you miss? I miss being able to visit him, even though I haven't seen him outside of prison for the last four or five years. I missed being able to go and go and see him. And like dad was always a character, just go and have the crack with him. And I I think it was kind of too that when I went to my dad's house, it's like that was home. That was that's where my sisters were. That's where everything was. And in a weird way, that was my safe place. It's nothing weird about it. And do you no longer feel that way? Not as much so since Sarah came home. Okay. I still do. It's like even only two nights ago, I had a dream about him that he was standing at the end of my bed and dad used to do like this weird laughing face. And I had a dream he was at the end of my bed and I was trying to say something to him, but nothing was coming out of my mouth. Right. Overall, you would feel a connection between a sense of being trapped. And alone. Yeah. And alone. Yeah. At work, I have loads of people around me. You could 
you could be in a room with a million people, but if the one person that you crave isn't there, you still feel so alone in your head. And do you crave him when you're in work? I wouldn't say as much so in work because work, I'm kept going and kept busy and stuff. But when I'm at home, I do, yeah. So it's not that unusual. It's quite common, just most people won't voice it. It's the contradiction between the person who hurt you the most in a strange way is the person you felt safest with. I don't know if we would have felt safest with dad, but I know the only place I ever felt safe was at home. It is a contradiction and you're pulled every direction because one, it doesn't make sense and two, you're judging yourself for feeling that. Yeah. But it is yeah. quite normal. I know we felt it. Like even when I got married, I wanted to come back to my only one and go home. Yeah. Because I, I didn't feel safe. It was a world I didn't want to be part of. When the home house was there, that I seen my sisters more and I seen my sister's kids more. And when the home house is gone, like the family home, it's like you don't feel so much a family, if that makes sense. You just yeah. kind of live in, you're yeah. living your separate lives. That's in the past, but it's hard to accept at times. Yeah, it's like the connection is gone. And the it's sense gone, yeah. The it's family. like the root of the tree is gone. So you just have to go and survive yourself in the big bad world. Your father would have been the controller. So he would have been the one yeah. who controlled everybody else. And therefore, yeah. your world revolved around him. So it would be very yeah. normal to be feeling what you're feeling. And the COVID would definitely throw you back in there because mm -hmm. of the isolation and the forced isolation. The terrifying news you're hearing every day. Even Father's Day coming up, I was even thinking to myself yesterday while well, I send him a card and I was thinking, you're being stupid. He used to get like excited when it was birthdays and Father's Day and stuff like that. Even if it was something out of the pound shop, you'd feel great giving it to him. Make him happy to make him proud in a way. <laughs> yeah. Well, you would have been looking for his approval. You wouldn't have known that's what you were doing, but that's exactly what you were doing. Is it also driven by the fear of being on your own two feet in the world? Maybe combination of fear that and the belief that you're not capable of coping without them. if that was the truth and it probably is i don't know but if that was it it would make sense of why you feel you want to be with somebody that harmed you so much it's also a sign that they've done a really good job i was actually saying that to myself the last day it's like it's like when i got through all my cases and stuff people were calling me a survivor but i actually think i'm still a victim because my dad still has a certain amount of control over me. Can't be both at the same time, so. It's like I don't know any different. I do say, yeah, I'm a proud survivor of sexual abuse. But still, I do ask myself, am I a victim? Because I still love him, I still care for him, I still wish he was in my life. Everything about childhood sexual abuse is confusing because none yeah. of it makes any sense. Yeah. And you tend to spend a lot of your life confused until you unravel every aspect of your feelings. And whatever they are, they're yours and you're entitled to them. Yeah. I would never reprimand myself for anything that I'm feeling. Like if yeah. you're feeling you miss him, just honour that. But know that you are in a process and that could change. The more yeah. you learn about yourself, the more you move on with your life. Those feelings yeah. could just fall away. We're all just doing the best we can. Sophie, I actually think it is possible to love someone and hate their behaviour. They're two very different things. I always say, I think you do have to love someone to hate them. There is a very fine line between yeah. love and hate. I know at this point it's not wrong for loving him because at the end of the day he's my dad and there's nothing I can do in this world to change that. And I just, he wouldn't have got away and done what he'd done to me, I don't think, unless I loved him so much. Yeah. What you're feeling yeah. now is because you're being thrown back into your trauma. When you're in your trauma, you don't feel strong on your own two feet. So you naturally would be levitating towards wanting what you considered as a child to be your strength. That's all it is. Yeah. Victims like us, people who have been abused and people who have been groomed. I jumped right back into a defense mechanism that I wasn't even aware of. I was getting more and more angry. Everything was annoying me. me. I was ready to explode and have an argument with anybody. And then I just stopped for a minute and went, oh, hold on, there's something very real and very comfortable about this. Blindly following rules and that. I have issues with that anyway. Yeah. I know I fell back into what I would have considered a defense mechanism when I was growing up and my survival mechanism that I thought I had become aware of and it was no longer something that would happen without me being aware of it. But I slipped back into it really quickly because of, I think, because of all the fear that I internalized 
when they started all this. I can't make head or tail of what's going on for me now. I just feel like, fuck this. I don't want to get out of bed in the morning. I get out because maybe I have to. The first thought when I wake up is not another day. What am I going to do today? If I bake one more thing, <laughs> so there's no one even here to eat. Oh, no. And then the time seems to go at such a slow pace. A day feels like a week. I have had it now. When I think of how depressed I feel at times, I think of being a teenager because it's the last time I remember feeling like this. I didn't want to be here. I don't want to die. I just want this to stop. And don't even ask me what this is, but it's a feeling I don't want. And I haven't had it for a long, long time. I could cry at the drop of a hat. And I haven't a notion what's going on to make me feel like this. But it's there, it's constant, it never ever goes. I might have an escape because I'm busy baking cakes or bread or something. It's just there. I'm awake most nights for a lot of the time. I can't sleep. I'd say if you did a poll, I'd say there's a lot of people not sleeping well. Yeah, because I wouldn't be sleeping either. A lot of the tools we used to get by were removed during COVID. Can I ask, did you replace those tools with anything else, Leona? Where I would have before met up with people for a cup of tea, I would now obviously just make the phone call. People around me are struggling. Everything just seems to kind of have changed. Everybody's mood is a little bit lower. My days, they're all slipping into each other. I don't feel like the day ever really ends. It's like a continuous day. I know it all in my mind what I need to do but I find it very hard to actually do it in reality you miss hugs you miss affection you miss all of those things that we took so for granted like I'm a very huggy person even though I find intimacy hard I find hugs amazing I love hugs um and I can't hug anyone <laughs> and I know that's a small thing but it's a massive no, it's thing it's not me. huge the thing about it that scares me most is the people that are doing it know exactly what they're doing we know people don't give a fuck about their own life, so we're going to put this on you now. It's not your life you're saving, Jim. It's Paulus. It's Eamon's. It's the kids. There, that, that's going to work a lot better. Do you know any mother that gives a fuck about herself? But if you tell her a child is in danger, there's nothing she won't do. At the beginning, we all thought it was what they were presenting it to be. But as time went on and no two people agreed, all of the top scientists, yeah, none of them agreed with each other. Now you started getting niggling doubts in the back of your mind, even if you weren't formulating them into a full-blown thought or a conversation. And that would have a tendency to shut me down more because the COVID was bad enough to have to deal with. But to have to deal with a possible conspiracy that I don't know anything about, that I don't know what the end game is, that's very difficult for me to cope with because that's covert, that's sneaky, that's dangerous. I don't know what the harm is to me or my life or my family and friends. If what they told us was real, well, then that's what we had to deal with. And that was bad. But when all of the suspicions came in about why are they trying to bump up the figures? Who benefits from that? You know, why do the rules not make any sense? Sophie, what about you? Does any of that connect with you? But one of my coping mechanisms is putting on a brave face. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it, when you think yeah. of it? Yeah. Because we all had to pretend nothing was happening. Exactly. You don't want people to know you're suffering. You don't want people to know you're weak or vulnerable. And how are you sleeping? I'm not sleeping great two, three hours a night some night. The shift I'm working is kind of weird at the minute. It's getting up at half two in the morning, finding it hard to go to bed at eight, nine in the evening. But even if I did go to bed at eight or nine, I'm still lying there till 11, half 11. And it's when I have to get up is when I'm wanting to sleep. I think people's mental health is more affected than half them even realise. Yeah. Like I know my mental health is affected. And I have never in my entire life been on the amount of medication I'm on now. And do I feel better? Absolutely not. It's not a day goes by I don't take medicine for something. Yeah. My medicine cabinet is full like it has never, ever been. It's where I robbed the chemist. That has never happened in my life. Yeah. I haven't cleaned my house. The iron in basket has to be overflown before I touch it. I would never be like that. I'm so organized, it's incredible. But I'm not. Like, these days go by here, I don't even see the floor. I have as much time as I want, and I feel I have been pulled in so many directions. I don't know what's going on. I know how you feel, because I think at the start of this, what I was getting from it was that community spirit, that sense of we're all in this together. 
when they were showing things about how the plan is doing great because we're not out there messing it up you couldn't give out about the coronavirus because something positive was really happening around you yeah the only bad thing about it is people yeah people in power that are misusing this power yeah. and misleading people instead of being genuine the ones at the top are making the rules that everybody else is supposed to follow and they don't even understand the impact of them because they're not impacting me. Not one of them are losing a penny. Not one of them are losing their job. They fill people with so much fear. And I find it hard to believe that people look at those in power and think they have our best interest in heart when they're making these decisions. They're actually giving themselves two pay increases. How do they sleep at night? The reason they can accept is because they actually do feel entitled to it. And they have a different way of thinking than we on the ground would have. A lot of it is to do with the frame of mind. So with that frame of mind, how on earth could they possibly be able to connect with people on the ground that are living a completely different life? And it's the same difference there that Paul is talking about. Like, I don't understand how they go to bed at night. They have no trouble going to bed at night because they, they don't feel what we feel. They're in a different bubble altogether. But yeah. the COVID restrictions has impacted in particular people who have experienced childhood trauma and we're not aware of it and then we give ourselves a hard time for not coping very well in it and that yeah. judgment that you make of yourself saying i'm stupid and it's silly what i'm thinking and yeah and not accepting or appreciating the fear you're living in that's triggering you straight back into your old coping mechanisms when the covid restrictions kicked in people didn't get any warning and so there was an adjustment period it was scary it was frightening and you didn't know what to expect but I think when the land settled a lot of the fear went I adjusted so it was an adjustment period but there was a time limit on that adjustment period and I didn't even know it I was okay up to a point and then it was like no this has gone too far I haven't got enough reserves to get me through much more it was like a point that Everybody reached. I could nearly feel it in the air. People that you'd meet were crankier. It was like people had been just tipped past the point they could cope with. Did you find that it got easier or harder as it went along, Leona? I find it definitely got harder for everybody. The phones were quiet at the beginning. In the past couple of weeks, people at their real wits end that they were ringing and they'd lost all sense of hope. And they've already reached out to a lot of services that can't help them. But even within myself, it's not like it was a novelty. I would never say it was a novelty, but it was like, oh gosh, okay, this is all changing. The whole place is all locked down. And it was all interesting. We were watching the news with a little bit of, oh God, I wonder how this person or this place will react. Pretty soon then it became, actually, Jesus, we don't know when it's all going to be all right again. And that does bring up the trauma. Something really bad can happen and just shake your whole fucking world where it's never yeah. the same again. I realise you've no control. But that is the scariest part. And, and like you say, people's mood are dropped and... And then there's this pressure from, and, and they mean well, don't get me wrong, but uh, do you know, it's like all the people that tell people that are depressed, just think positively. Oh, my son was out, he went for a five mile cycle with me today and fair play to them all. Now, don't get me wrong, but I'm getting through my days just about. My kids are probably not getting all the homework done and they're not learning new skills like how to change oil in a car and all those sorts of stuff. They've done a little bit of cooking at the start. They're certainly not still baking. They got sick of that and I got sick of asking them to. So there's this pressure there then to, to kind of make a massive positive out. I'm not able to do that. So I started taking that pressure back away again and said, just get through it. So, you know, just, just work my way through it is anybody else missing being able to hook people is that impacting anybody else ones with the masks and the gloves and thing. now i get it it's fear i understand that i say to them i absolutely respect where you're coming from i don't have to agree with it but i do respect and i understand in return i need the same kind of respect i'm not buying into that now i'm not saying i'm superwoman i don't believe in wearing gloves and masks to walk around I don't believe I have to walk across the road if somebody's walking by me. I'm not going around hugging people because we were told not to, but that pissed me off big time. I want to hug people. That's the scary part. Do you miss the physical contact with people, Sophia? Regarding other people, no. And I'm sorry for saying it, but it's my sister's kids that I miss hugging the most. Because I wouldn't be a huggy-wuggy person to other people anyway. Yeah, I see it's easier with children, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. 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 What about you, Jill? I'm very aware of how conditioned I am 
to feel my time is constructive. It's like when you go out and wash the car or cut the grass. I feel like, oh, well, I've ch- at least I've done something today. The whole day isn't a waste. I've made a difference. Yeah. Feeling that if you decide today I'm doing nothing, that you don't have any value. You don't exist. You don't matter. Do you always remember the outfit, Carlos? You can't be wasting your day in bed. And if he caught you sitting down at all, you were wasting your time. Yeah. But that's where we got that sense. Yeah. I struggle with that. And I do my best now to make sure for my mental health that I do some form of meditation as often as I possibly can. Sometimes I sit down and two hours have gone by and I realise I still haven't even done it yet. I've wasted my time on my phone or something. I keep procrastinating. But I am very aware that for my mental health, I have to do something like that to switch off. But it's this sense that it's a constant thing that's there, even if I meditate, even if I go and cut the grass and like I'm after cooking dinner, I'm after making the beds. I list things off to Eamon, to my husband when he comes in. What am I doing? It's like I'm giving him an itinerary of my day, but it's to make me feel that I matter, that I've done something that counts, that, that makes a difference. I could drop dead here on the floor. It might take me a few days to even realise I'm not moving. It's me. It's the torment is me. Yeah, that's it. I keep looking back and I can see me as a child, but there's still something about it. I'm not empathising with her. Like, on one level, absolutely, I get it. But just on another level, I'm still running away from her and it's something I don't want to own and I don't know exactly what that is. It's, it's work to be done. It's about self-acceptance and I haven't got there yet. Because I remember thinking one day, I could be free if I could just accept. If I could just accept. I don't care what it is I'm accepting. But at this moment, this is as good as it gets. So if I can accept that, I'd be laughing. That's what would bring me peace. Have you had to make any major changes to your life because of COVID, Leona? I've had to kind of step back from doing interventions myself because I've just been struggling. I've dipped a good bit because of the isolation that comes with it and and just trying to force myself to pick up that phone and make those calls has been hard, you know? I'm just curious, Leona, when you kick back into what you would have done before to survive, how long did it take you to recognise you were back in that? And did you give yourself a hard time thinking, oh my God, all that work I'm doing is, is just a waste. I'm back where I started. Yeah, a little bit. It was about a month that I didn't cry at all. And then there was a, a night there that it all came out, you know. So even though I was struggling throughout that month, I wasn't in my, what I'd say, emotional mind. I was more in my, in my rational mind of trying to problem solve and being tired and being exhausted. But then the emotions, I, I started crying and, and I could have sworn in those moments that I was right back to struggling. Luckily, I wasn't thinking to hurt myself now or anything like that. There was no moments like that. But I felt very, very hopeless. I was like, you know, I've learned nothing. What am I doing? I'm telling other people how to get well. And when here I am in buckets of tears and I can't stop. And, and I think I cried for about six hours that night. But then the next day I thought, okay, what do I need to do? No one's going to come on the phone here. No one's going to come knocking at my door and say, come on, I'll pull you out of this, <laughs> especially during COVID. The answer basically was to, to let the day be over. Allow those six hours to be a tough six hours and to say, God, today isn't going to be easy, but it's going to be a little bit better than that. I'll bounce back quicker than I used to. And within a few days, I was back to functioning perfectly fine again. So I think for me, it's not about whether or not you get to that low place because a lot of the time sometimes we can't prevent that sometimes we can sometimes we can't but it's about how quickly we can get ourselves back out of it again when you're doing work like what we do and what you do and you're trying to help other people you you put an expectation on yourself that you're not allowed to fall down and you have to change that and by denying it and trying to be strong you're actually not helping anybody exactly yeah and about knowing your limits like that we have people that are affected by suicide and I had about seven interventions from different people all in the same month. And they were all really hard, tough interventions. So I did. I reached out to the committee and I said, guys, actually, I'm struggling myself. I was getting angry. I was angry at the services. I was angry at myself. And I was saying, look, I need to mind myself here. And I I just said, I'm not going to take any interventions for a month because I've taken all of those together. I'm glad I did get involved. All of those people are okay. But at the same time, I was able to recognize, actually, I'm at a max here. My mood was, was changing. I was getting lower. It was my kids and myself that was paying a heavy price for that. So I needed to kind of reach out and say, actually, guys, I'm at my limit here. 
to the committee is amazing. Say knowing yourself, being aware of your own boundaries and your own limitations and being able to put your hand up and say, actually, I have a lot going on myself at the minute. And I'd love to be able to be there, but if I can't ask the question about somebody else feeling suicidal and, and actually sit with them in their pain right now, I shouldn't be asking the question at all. So I need somebody else to step into those shoes. And luckily we have enough volunteers to be able to do that. Sophia, do you think you're judging yourself for how you're feeling or responding to the COVID? Yeah. I was doing fantastic. I was working out at home and I was doing my weights and stuff like that. And then about three weeks ago, I just gave it all up lost interest in absolutely everything yeah and like i was tired all the time i was groggy i just i just didn't care we yeah. all felt we could cope up to a point and then it was like no this is going on too long i haven't got enough in yeah. me when you realize that you're responding in this COVID restriction exactly the same as every other trauma victim that that eases it a little bit because you know it was, yeah it's not just you one of the main things I have noticed about myself is I do get angry at myself a lot for stupid things and agitated and kind of even when I see myself in the mirror feeling worthless and stuff like that. I have been feeling like that the last two or three weeks. Yeah. And it's because I know I'm not working out or anything like that either. Because I don't want to give, it's like I don't want to reward myself for anything. Yeah. And it's going to be really good for you that you've said that out loud. <laughs> because once you formalise that into an actual thought and you can hear yourself saying it, you realise how unfair that is on yourself. Start introducing positive affirmations to yourself. And if you look at yourself in the mirror and you hear yourself criticising, challenge it on the spot. Mm -hmm. Just go, that isn't true. I'm really doing great. I'm doing the best I can here. This is difficult and I'm managing it. Can you imagine now, even with that insight, of how difficult it was in your childhood to yeah. have that for years, not for days or weeks or months, for years? I think it's great for you to understand why going to school, learning anything new, going out to play, why all of those things were so difficult as a child, because mm -hmm. of the level of energy it took just to survive. And if mm -hmm. nothing else, this COVID is a glimpse at that. And I see what they're proposing for children when I understand how much trauma impacts on a child and how parents, in whatever way they're thinking, will allow that to happen. For a child to be either sprayed down or temperature taken by people in hazmat suits or them going into little pods and telling a child they can't either hug or play with their friend, that has lifelong consequences. That's yeah. the most concerning in all of this. My three-year-old grandson keeps asking me, are you still sick, Nanny? I have to stay away. I'm dangerous. And he's scared. And I think, Jesus, Mary Joseph, like, you've no idea the damage you're doing. No. I'm getting some things like I was always the mother of the family. I felt like nobody was there. I didn't, nobody needed me. What am I going to do with myself? Who am I? Then I said, no, I don't want to be the mother of the family. I actually feel lighter. Because of that's gone. It just feels like such a contradiction. I am torn asunder inside and I don't know which end me is up. Guys, if that's gone, but our natural disposition is to replace it. So it's what are you replacing it with? Oh, I didn't say it's gone, Paula. I'm saying these are the waves I'm getting. Right. Like sometimes I think, oh, this is great. I have a handle on it. And then I just feel like, Jesus, here it comes again. You know, every time I think I'm coming out of it, Another way it comes, I'm, I'm just sick of it. Like, <laughs> I'm not playing. There's unconscious levels we're not even aware of. Like, yeah. I would absolutely say I'm proud of myself, that I love myself, that I'm a good person. I couldn't always say that. Yeah. So I know I've done work. I don't know where that comes from or where that's stored in your body or in your mind. I know it benefits you, but it doesn't mean you're done. Do you know what I mean? There are other things that have escaped you that you don't even identify until something like this comes up. And I'm happy to have the opportunity to become aware of it on such a level that I want to do something about it. And I don't know what it is. It's like I've hit a wall. That's where I am. I'm willing. Yeah. And I think I'm even able, but I just don't know. You know, every little thing you do pushes you to want a bit more for yourself. I have very little patience. I still want the answer now. 
but it's the not know and it's the not understand and the waves and the depth of them. That sense that I'm completely out of control. I don't know what's happened or why. It's all of that. There's levels of the same thing. Yeah. And it's not that you haven't healed, but I think because we were so insecure, every time we got a, a sense that something wasn't right, we felt and we placed ourselves back at the start line. Yeah. Believing that we were no good, we couldn't do it, we haven't done it, nothing has been achieved, all of that. Sophia, have you any concerns about your mental health? One of the main things that re I'm really struggling with is not being able to go to the gym. That was great for my mental health, I found yeah. that brilliant. What concerns me the most is that I'm going to get used to being in this state of mind, if that makes sense. Because it's going on so long now and nobody knows where it's going to end. I haven't felt like this, I'd say, even when I was a child, but it's like after court, I felt like a child again after it, all the buzz of it was over. That makes sense as well, and we were the same, because your whole life is on display there. Yeah, and even though I wasn't seeing my counsellor every week, but I need to see her. Yes, it's all right to say, well, I'm not doing great now. No. Nobody is doing great in this present situation. No. Even when I am the best, if in the best form in the world, when everything is going perfect, I'm always waiting for something to go wrong. Well, what's going to happen? What's next? Who's going to hurt me? Who's going to get hurt? Who's, yeah. who's going to that? When you come from the kind of backgrounds we've all come from, there's a, a level of, of drama or crisis that's in your life all the time when you're growing up. You know, it's constantly, it's in the background. You're aware that there's something just in the background and you're trying to stay away from it. So when this all came out at a start at the beginning of the COVID, I think all of us would have clicked into, well, this is in, in a way it's kind of normal for us to know that some disaster is about to befall everybody. But it's when that passes, it is that time limit. When that passes and you realize, oh, actually, this is not actually going away. And yeah. the familiarity with that, living with that level of anxiety is what kicks, well, for me, what would have kicked me back into the trauma mode it's that knowing that this is a constant this is what i lived with but yeah. i don't want to live with it anymore and i think that's frightening for a lot of people you know that level of drama that you're talking about in the background that was really keeping the secret you know what i mean yeah. so that was the the 24 7 fight or flight the anxiety would that you would have carried around with you on a daily basis and so you're right that would have been familiar so when anything dramatic happens here in our adult life there is a familiarity but i personally recognized what i must have done as a child was that denial because part of me after i got over the flight and the adjustment of this new norm i decided it wasn't happening it just wasn't real and i'm not having it so <laughs> i think that's what i did as a child and so, Leona, I would ask you, can you recognise a trait or a behaviour that you had in this situation that you can connect back to the past? And for me, it's, it's kind of living the double life, the life of what I'm prepared to let people see, um, which is, oh, yeah, I'm coping all right. And like that at the beginning, trying to pick the positives. And I was one of those people that put up a poll saying, look, do you know, there's less people on the road. We're all getting to spend time with our children. And I meant it at the time. I know. Pretty soon it turned into that double life that I would have led for longer than I can remember, well after the abuse even stopped, between yeah. what was actually really going on for me and what I was, uh, I was prepared to let out there. And I suppose COVID would have brought that in, in the sense of trying to let it, make it look as though I'm coping a lot better than what I actually am and nearly trying to be a role model to let's get through this together. And I did some DIY, I, I did this and that at the beginning. But when I lay down at night, I missed people, I missed company, I missed hugs, I missed being able to go out and about, I missed my routine, I wasn't sleeping. My days and my nights were completely mixed up. I didn't know which day it was. So I was out there on one hand, pretending everything was fine. And, and I did that a lot as a teenager. You know, I was in school and I was in all honours classes. If you were to look at me, you wouldn't have thought that there was anything wrong. And late at night, I was probably cutting my thighs up. Nothing happened in my personal life to cause this. So I didn't see it coming. And I wasn't ready for it. You know, it was yeah. like the bloody world brought it. A huge sense of unfairness of why bloody now? You know, why is this happening? And that sense of unfairness that kind of puts us back into victim mode a little bit isn't yeah. good for us either. But it's there all the same. Yeah, I just think the longer it goes on, it's, it's almost like we have the ability to get through 
a time, but the time being extended, I cannot sleep at night now. I would be up most of the night. My head is waking up, but I, it's not telling me anything I need to hear. It's not being crystal clear. So I'm just as confused in the morning as I was going to bed. And I think the longer it goes on, the harder it is to pretend that we're managing and coping, okay? That would be for me now. But I'm not managing. I'm not coping. Hey, the truth of the matter is this work that we're doing is, is the only focus that's saving us from slipping into. Oh, death. yeah, absolutely. So uh, that's what I was asking you, Leona. Do you feel the longer goes on, uh, the more at risk your mental health is and other people that are using Haven Hub? It's getting worse as time goes on and people can kind of cope with anything temporary wise. And I think Joyce is spot on there. What spoke out to me while Joyce was talking was, was uncertainty. Without, I suppose, focusing too much on back with the trauma, but that was the hardest part. You didn't know what was coming next. You didn't know how you'd feel. You didn't know what to prepare yourself for the next day. And no one was, was able to kind of come together and talk about it as, as you do with normal problems. And with this, it was the same. We don't know what's going to be open. We don't know what's going to be closed. And with the Haven Hub, you get people ringing in with various problems, say if they're in domestic abuse situations. And yet the shelters that we'd normally recommend are at a maximum and because of COVID and, and distance restrictions, they're not open. So you find yourself then kind of tell people what you never had to tell people, which is all they can do is give you a sleeping bag. There is nowhere that you can go. And they're hard conversations. They're really lengthy, emotional conversations to have. But I can't actually support someone as much as I've been doing why I'm feeling this way. So, so that's why it's handy, say, with the Haven Hub, because there's over 30 volunteers. And because oh, I put my face to what I do, I get a lot of people that will contact me personally that are struggling or that their family is struggling. And it's very hard to say, well, I won't help you, but I'll put you on to someone who will because they can't trust them as much. And all you want to desperately do is help them. So I've had to really challenge myself to, to watch my own limits because... You can't give someone a tenner if you only have a fiver, do you know? <laughs> but like a lot of people are just getting to their wits end. It's going on so long now and none of us know when everything just goes back to how it was. And that's the thing, you experience trauma. It never did go back to how it was. Everything changed for you in those moments. It never got to go back to being okay again. I kind of feel the, the most dangerous thing for anybody who's had trauma, whether you've recovered from it or not, is isolation. And the yeah. one thing about this COVID is the isolation. So with that in mind, how do we help people get through this? There is a famous saying, education is the key to freedom. And, you know, to a degree, I absolutely agree with that. But I often, in communities like ours, I don't think that's step one. I think the education required here is for people to have a sense of themselves and their own power. They still haven't cottoned on to the fact that you need to start teaching people about emotional intelligence. You need to be teaching them life skills. You do need to be doing a self-development course. You need spirituality, you know, yoga and meditation. There is a huge awakening and a huge awareness around what's going on in the world. But there is still a huge degree of fear. And so yeah, when you're indoctrined into believing that you need to stay in, wash your hands, wear a mask, wear gloves, or else you're going to be killing other people. People just respond to that and then think, all the, anybody else who breaks those rules are just rebels. And if you watch the stages of where they introduce fear into the media and into your daily life, and they did it in stages, they did it in layers. Yeah, isn't it three weeks it takes to form a habit? If somebody disagrees with what they're saying, then you're called an anti-vaxxer or you're a conspiracy theorist. Nothing to do with that. You have a right yeah. to question what's going on in the world. And yeah. it is a form of grooming. It's a form of programming. Yeah, it is. If nothing else, through this COVID situation, I realised I didn't even understand the importance of physically being in the presence of somebody while having a conversation. I didn't understand the importance that was in my own life until it was taken away from me. That jumped out at me as well. I think I had to collect something from one of, uh, one of my friends. And like that, we were trying to social distance and was probably in both of our heads without saying anything. And I was going out the door and he just caught me by the arm. And I swear to God, my eyes filled up straight away. I didn't know what it was, but it was just actually having someone that I cared about just actually reach out and touch my arms and hope you're doing okay. It's that physicalness that we're all being told we don't know when we can have it back. People around you who, if you're having mental health difficulties, are equally as exhausted at this stage because they're trying their best to motivate you 
and they're exhausted at this stage. They don't have anything left themselves. I know in Limerick Mental Health, we're also kind of ringing around people. So there's people that we would ring every day and just check in with them and just say, just how are you doing? And, and that means a lot to some people that somebody cares enough to pick up the phone and say, can I check with you? How are you doing today? It's changing the system to reach out more because otherwise you'll just go under that duvet and we all know the result of that. The thing that comes hand in hand with depression or feeling suicidal is self-hatred. So when you're hating yourself, you'd be better sitting in a room with your worst enemy than yourself. What they've done, now you're not responsible for you because you can say, I don't care, I'm going to take the risk. You're responsible for everybody else. Absolutely, yeah, that was clever. That was clever. It was like, act as if you have COVID. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, for God's sake. Like, I don't know if any of you have been inside the dumb stores. No. But I'm telling you, that is brainwashing at the highest degree. You wouldn't see it in an army. Suddenly we're all guilty. We even stay too long talking to the person behind the counter in the shop. We hear all the noises from the shopping centre saying, please don't delay, please get what you need to get the hell out of here, basically. I'm looking around uh, and I'm feeling love like I haven't felt ever. Because when I see the community pulling together, really genuinely worried about how you're doing and checking on their neighbours, like, that takes my breath away. I think that's the way it should be. That's the way it used to be. You know, neighborhoods used to be like that. It's like being pulled in two different directions. When I'm in a good mood, I would say the COVID is great because it is a trigger. It's thrown us into a place where there's still wounds that haven't healed fully. It has the opportunity to give us a deeper understanding of it. But at the same time, I feel like I'm not man. I've had it. I want to throw a tantrum now and go home. Because of COVID, I suppose the good thing that would have come out of it is they reconnected with some family and stuff like that. And that's been nice. Um, and we've had some family Zoom meetings and, and things like that. And it's just been lovely. Um, and we've felt the need to check in with each other on a family perspective. You know, one of them is pregnant, so she's to mind herself. And my parents would be at, the, at that age. My dad has COPD. So, so we're all very, very careful. And we're all a little bit worried and concerned. When we're on and speaking to each other, we're not talking about the light stuff. We're, we're, we're all kind of struggling in our own ways. And so even the conversations are a little bit heavier than normal. And then with friends, to be honest, I don't have the space, to be honest, right now to check in with a lot of people. Sophia, are you struggling to cope with the uncertainty that COVID has brought? Yeah, because I'm the type of person that I have to have everything planned for next week. If I don't, I kind of panic a bit and that does get to me a bit is that I can't plan anything because I don't know what's happening and that does make me agitated. That's one of your coping mechanisms, that strategy of feeling yeah. in control. Yeah, even before all the COVID, if someone contacted me and said, do you want to do something tomorrow? I'd be like thinking of an excuse to say, can you not put it off for a day or two? It's like if something's in my diary, I can't do it. Yeah. Even if I got held back at work, I freak out because I come home at a certain time and I have it in my head. I do the dishes this time, I wash the floors this time, and it's stupid. Like You have to stop that language. Every thought you're, you have, every behavior, every reaction, every response is as a direct result of what you've been through. And therefore, yeah. it's all perfectly normal. And you're not stupid and you're not wrong. Everything you're feeling is valid. And it's and, necessary to get yeah, you through. Yeah, I would say to Sophie, it's very good for you to actually recognise what you're saying. That mm -hmm. these are coping mechanisms. This is yeah. what you used to hide your vulnerability. Yeah. Uh, and not face it even yourself. Like we all do that. I'm, I'd be expert at this one. It might be a time to sit with that and see what that genuinely feels like. The end game is for you to fully understand why you did what you did, why you behaved the way you did. We all know it's about survival, but there was more behind it. It was like we came up with this plan to hide who we were. It was all part of mask, and there could have been several of them, and we used them in the world. But we didn't ever learn how to switch them off, and we didn't even acknowledge that we had them. The good thing and the bad thing, this situation you're being handed an opportunity to, to look at those masks they're not yours somebody gave them to you yeah and it's about owning it but at the same time you own something you create yourself not something that was pushed on you yeah and you are not going to die if you don't wash your floor at eight o'clock <laughs> you know I mean? that throws you into panic and it is about what paula said the control and we're using these things to convince yourself 
we're okay and we're normal. And yeah. we are all of those things, but we're so much more. Yeah. And you're not the person that he created. You're a wonderful person on your own. And you need to know that and own it. Now, if I could mm-hmm. fucking practice half of what I'm telling you. I know, I just say that as well. If I could practice what I preach, I'd be an amazing person. I just feel like I just want inner peace. I want to be at peace no matter what I'm doing. Now, I know that sounds like pie in the sky. When I step back out with my own stuff, I kind of think on a bigger scale, what's going on here is a global opportunity for change. But you still have choice. And my fear is that they won't make the fun one. <laughs> yeah. At the end of all this, you know, the people will have connected with that love that you're talking about witnessing in the communes and how getting your priorities in the right place and recognize that people are what matter, not money or things. The one thing I keep saying is we have to have that level of hope of it cannot last forever. And we have to keep coming back to that of this will get to end. And that was something that throughout the trauma, I wish I was able to tell myself is someday this will be over. Someday this won't be like this. And someday I won't feel this bad. And even though this is nowhere near what I was going through back then, being able to know that and be able to reassure myself, someday this will be a memory. It's not a very good thing though. You know the way they say there's good in everything and there's a reason for everything and no matter what experience you have and you're going to learn something from it, we are all revisiting our past in some form or fashion and I always feel if you revisit, there's a reason, there's remnants of it that you haven't looked at or haven't let go or haven't forgiven yourself or whatever it is. But there's always some learning in it. When you think what you're learning, you are able to sit there now and say, like, this too will pass. But that is the truth about everything we go through. But even with the knowledge now that this too will pass, I'd be thinking, there's something there that I'm just not getting. And until I get it, I don't care if COVID is gone or not. But I do think there's an opportunity here for me to be with me. I don't like the opportunity. I'd much prefer to get on with my life. And I'm trying my best, like you, to just say, let's just get through the day. Now stop the baking and the running and whatever distractions we're coming up with. Just let it be and see what happens. Now all that's happening is I'd cry more, but I have no understanding at the end of the day that this is why you're crying or this is what you're feeling. Like when I was young, I really needed desperately to know and to understand what I was feeling and why. Now I just want to feel it, get it over it, and maybe the answers will come later on. Maybe they won't. I don't know. But I'm happy enough to feel miserable and sad and depressed without trying to understand why anymore. And to me, that's a huge thing. I agree. Like, I think that's one of the biggest learnings I would have had, Joyce, was some problems that we have. We think, I need to sit down and I need to sit with this. I need to figure it out. I need to problem solve it. And a lot of things in our lives that will do us justice when we do that but when we're actually struggling within ourselves the worst thing we can sometimes do is try and demand answers from ourselves because our minds are so messed up in those moments that we can't do it so I think the biggest thing for me would be when now when I'm struggling I try not to ask why does this keep happening why did it happen now learn any lessons from it just in those moments I try not to sit with it and problem solve it and and work it out because I'm never going to work it out in those moments. I need to get through it. I need to come out and be stronger and better. And then there might be some learning looking back in hindsight. To take that pressure off actually makes it pass a little bit easier. Thank you for listening. Hopefully some of the information we've shared will resonate with you and bring you to a place where you can have compassion for yourself. Please know that no matter how you feel or how you respond to the abuse, it was normal. We're hopeful and optimistic that those in a position of power to bring about change will be moved into action so we can finally eradicate childhood sexual abuse. So please spread the word and share the information. The decision to heal from childhood sexual abuse places you on the most important journey of your life. You're in charge of this journey. Only you know what works for you and what doesn't. It takes as long as it takes because there's no rush in it and there's no fake in it. You have to feel it. And just as the ripple of pain that you're in goes out 
and impacts all of those around you. So does the healing. And the more you heal, the more everyone around you benefits from your healing. You've been listening to the Kavna Sisters podcast. You can contact us through Facebook, Twitter and Instagram or email the Kavna Sisters at gmail.com.